Yeah, thanks. Um, I first want to thank CGCAS for inviting me to the lecture, to lecture this evening on some of my research that I've been doing, both uh, in my PhD program and my even prior to my PhD program. I've worked a lot and I've had a lot of interest in the antebellum Florida, primarily because a lot of people, it's not well known or understood. Um, a lot of people go from Spanish period of Florida straight over to the Civil War, and that period in between really isn't a whole lot written or studied about that. Um, the reason I picked St. Joseph, and I'll talk tonight about the Forgotten City, is because this city is, is seminal in the, uh, well, in the founding of the state, yet you read history books or you're taught history in school, or even if you read something about early history of Florida, it's sometimes literally only given a, cl a cliff note in history. Partially it's because not a lot's understood about it. Um, and we'll get about that, we'll go more into that in a minute. Um, so that's why I call it the Forgotten City because uh, when I discuss or talk about it, very few people have ever heard about uh, St. Joseph. So just to kind of orient everybody, because I, I don't assume we all uh, are from Florida. I don't assume that we all know where the Panhandles is, even though I, I probably most of you do. Just to give you an idea, uh, St. Joseph is located in, in, the, in, the, in the Panhandle of Florida, right along here of St. Joseph Bay. And it's home to um, Port St. Joe. And uh, if anyone, I don't know if anyone's been to Port St. Joe, but there's uh, it's a small town um, that uh, has a lot of, has a really vibrant beach community and was established um, many years after St. Joseph, not and not related to St. Joseph's development, just people happen to settle there for, for similar reasons and, and different reasons as well. So to really understand St. Joseph's history, you kind of have to go back in a second and talk about um, land because it all stems from land. I'm gonna go through this pretty, pretty quickly uh, since it's just more about building up to a, con a context for you. So everyone knows Spanish was settled by, by the Spanish um, in the first Spanish period. It's pain, thank you. Um, if you don't know, 1513, Ponce de Leon came to Florida, followed up by uh, several explorers, um, Narvaez and Hernando de Soto being two large ones in the mid 15th century. The important thing about these settlements is to know that the Spanish claimed everything. Uh, everything they could see, as far as they could see, they went and they planted their flag and they claimed uh, as much the East Coast. Um, of course, later on, they had no ability to sustain that kind of claim, but needless to say, uh, Florida, uh, along with a big chunk of uh, the Gulf Coast, all the way up into um, maybe all the way as far as Texas, was kind of claimed as Spanish territory. And the reason that land in, in this first Spanish period is so important is because um, Spain had a really hard time settling Florida. Uh, we all know about St. Augustine, uh, which was established in 1565. We know about um, Pensacola, which is founded, well, it's permanently settled. If you ask people from Pensacola, they may disagree. Founded in 1698. And there were several uh, missions that were dotted across, um, searching from St. Augustine to the Florida Panhandle in the 1630s. But even for the beginning, Spain had a hard problem keeping a hold of, of, of Florida and settling Florida. And that's going to come into play a little later on as to why uh, St. Joseph exists today. So, in 1763, the Seven Years' War, which was also known as the Indian War, um, the French and Indian War, excuse me, in America, came to an end. And Great Britain and the American colonies had won. Spain and France, the combined forces, had, had, had lost. And so during this, this process, the armies of Great Britain had conquered uh, Canada and several French islands in the Caribbean. They also stormed and occupied Havana, Cuba, which was important to the Spanish government as it was a principal uh, administrative district for Spanish America. So 
like a lot of things, when you lose a war, you tend up to end up on the short end of what happens, how the world, how things are divvied up at the end. So to the Treaty of Paris and the end of the war, uh, Canada was still out by England. Um, several of the Caribbean islands were returned to France and Spain um, in exchange for Florida were then uh, given back uh, Havana and um, uh, as part of that process. And so at this point by 1763, Great Britain now controlled all of North America east of the Mississippi River. Um, and this caused a, a mass exodus of people in Spanish Florida. So Britain was again faced with the same consequence of trying to bring people to settle in Florida because the best way to colonize a place is to actually get people to live there. Um, but uh, as you probably can tell by the, uh, the date of 1763, um, the American colonies rebelled and the British crown then lost. So uh, we all know about France's contribution to the American Revolution, but Spain was also uh, a part of that. And because of Spain's help to the American Revolution, Florida was transferred back to Spain um, by the Treaty of, um, as part of the, the peace agreement in 1783. Again, just like Spain happened, they had switched places and occupied. But importantly, during this, this uh, British period, a lot of um, British companies were formed and, and established these trade networks, these trade outposts that were scattered up and along the, I don't know if you can see my mouse here, up along the kind of panhandle along the, the, the uh, border with, uh, with Georgia and Florida. And these companies still stayed and existed after Spain um, took it over. They were granted continuation or granted permission by the Spanish crown to continued operation. So these British, British uh, uh, companies played an important role in, in land ownership. Uh, and we'll get later, we'll have the, the Forbes company being uh, a major part of the reason why St. Joseph's today. But uh, what's important about the, the second Spanish period is that Spain began to um, give away land. I mean, they were like Oprah. Uh, you get you get a plot of land. You get a plot of land. You get a plot of land. Pretty much, if you if you did anything to appease the Spanish government, you got land. And this was all done to kind of entice um, settlement. But a problem that remained was that the deeds from the first Spanish period were never settled, and so that land was sold to the British in that period, and then people came back and took ownership of that land. The second Spanish period. So the point of this is to understand that a lot of the same tracts of land had multiple owners and multiple claims to them. But Spanish Florida's days were numbered. Um, by 1800, Spain's fortune and power had waned. Um, her Montsuati empire was crumbling and the Spanish crown was, was bleeding for, for money and didn't really have the ability to kind of control and keep um, Florida, if they if someone wanted to say invade the state and take it over, uh, and they tried everything they could to keep it. Florida was a you know between Spain and their colonies in, in Mexico or New Spain. Um, Florida was a, a pivotal kind of strategic point, uh, only protecting their gold fleet as it moved from the colonies in Mexico to uh, Spain, but also kind of added a buffer um, to additional. Um, British control and encroachment. So as this influence waned, um, the United States had, and I love this picture here of the, of the uh, eagle. It looks like more like a dove to me than an eagle, but the eagle that's got Florida in there because at this point, America had won the revolution and the idea of manifest destiny which we all know was about going from ocean to ocean, but Manifest Destiny also extended on to Peninsula of Florida. And so Spain and the United States had an agreement that uh, Spain would uh, retain control and, and keep and maintain um, the Native American populations in Florida from crossing over and going into the United States. The reason this is important is because uh, a lot of escape 
slaves would, would flee to Florida where they would then be adopted by these, these tribes and have additional autonomy. So eventually they could escape slavery by fleeing and getting as far as Florida. And of course, Georgia, Alabama, Mississippi, and the, the, the heavily, um, the, the, the South with its large population of, in, of in, enslaved people, I didn't like this. So um, a guy by the name of Andrew Jackson, uh, at that point a general and later president, uh, began to kind you know took it upon himself uh, with permission of uh, President Monroe to begin to, to to quell or protect the interests of the United States. This is important because in uh, in March fifteenth uh, of eighteen eighteen, uh, General Jackson gathered hundred U.S. regular troops, a thousand Tennessee volunteers, a thousand Georgia, Georgia military, and about one thousand four hundred Lower Creek warriors at Fort Scott and began to invade Florida under the auspice of enforcing the treaty that the United States had with Spain to keep um, Seminole Indians from traversing into lower Georgia, which had a lot, you know, been their traditional grounds prior to the arrival of, of Europeans, and also to prevent uh, slaves from the, the, the plantations in Georgia primarily, but also Alabama and South Carolina from escaping into Florida. And so this kind of, spurred off a major uh, realization the Spanish crown that they, because of the, the Seven Years' War, because of their waning influence and because of their shrinking uh, military forces, they couldn't have it all. They couldn't have their cake and eat it too. So they had to give something up. And they preferred to keep um, their territory of New Spain and in instead cede Spain to, 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 to America. Because at some point they wanted to get something for the property and they were afraid, and probably, probably right, rightly so, that the, um, the American uh, government would eventually take, take it by force and there was really nothing they could do about it. Spain had long rejected American efforts to purchase Florida, um, but by 1818, they had no choice. So depleted from the Peninsular War from 1807 to 1814, I guess Napoleon in Europe and needing to kind of rebuild their, their influences in their colonies, they decided to give Florida away, um, really exchange it for, for debt that they owed to the American government um, so that, that they could focus and, and bring, put their efforts into and their resources into protecting their, um, their Central American and South American interests, which had been raging internally within a revolutionary war in 1810, and they were contending with that and putting a lot of resources into that. So what's important to note is that uh, at this point, um, these British companies and all these land claims that had you know, kind of piled up over the years were still a problem. They were still there. So, one of the major content contentions with what eventually became the uh, Adams on each treaty uh, was when at what point do, does the American government have to recognize Spanish land claims? And during this years long um, negotiation of 1819, uh, the Spanish crown was doing its Oprah, its Oprah thing and they were just giving out land and giving out land, and giving out land because Quite frankly, Spain didn't want to give up Florida. So they thought, well, since we can't have it, we'll just give a lot of it away to our, our Spanish citizens. And so, you know, Florida won't have a lot of it to sell uh, to make money, which is what they, they wanted to do as part of that Western expansion. So when Florida was taken over, was, was formally transferred Territory for, for formally transferred to the United States government. One of the first things this government had to do was create a commission on dealing with land purchases. And at the time, these land purchases were, excuse me, they were, um, they had to be dealt with by the US Supreme Court. And Spain, to make things even more difficult, had taken all of their land records with them back to Havana, Cuba. So when the flags are raised over, uh, over Pensacola, American flags raised over Pensacola and St. Augustine, Spanish administration had left them nothing. 
And of course, they immediately became inundated with uh, requests to recognize various grants. Needless to say, this created a lot of contention with the United States government, and they began to really uh, hone down on trying to invalidate a lot of these, these, these land grants. One particular that's important for this case is that of the Forbes purchase. So uh, Forbes controlled very various um, trading posts along the Florida Georgia border. And in a, several periods of time, debt had been incurred by uh, Native American tribes in exchange for actual credit or in exchange for actual goods. They, would, they gave over um, their land in exchange to settle debts with this company. Uh, one of those was a piece of property ceded by the Seminole Lower Creeks to the John Forbes and Company in 1840-1811. It became known as the, the Forbes Purchase. And the grant comprised 1.4 million acres of land uh, on the Gulf of Mexico between Apachacola and the Color River. Importantly, a little town you may have heard of called Apachacola that quickly began to establish itself in this property. The reason they did that is because a lot of these massive claims were being rejected by the Supreme Court for either no proof of, of ownership or perhaps the, the, they were sold land that wasn't by somebody whose land it wasn't, didn't have any right to sell. So the Forbes purchase um, was one of these large grants that Americans fleeing to uh, Americans settling uh, down south had just assumed would be, you know, invalidated and, you know, allowed to be to be sold. And, and American citizens were coming down and kind of building houses and, and claiming plots before they actually had owned it. However, the Forest Purchase was one of the few land, large land claims that had been um, actually upheld by the Supreme Court. Uh, particularly, um, they recognized the sale of this property um, in 1817 to uh, two merchants, one from Savannah and one from Cuba. So needless to say, we had the situation, and at the time, Apachacola was the third largest uh, exporter of cotton and import of goods into the interior south. So there's a lot of money coming in and out of this port. And some very um, industrious individuals uh, seeing this happening began to kind of concoct this plan of establishing a rival city along St. Joseph Bay in order to uh, take away or capture the, um, the business that had been going through Apalachicola. And they would have been successful. So as this was all going down, and unfortunately for, for the citizens of St. Joseph, the uh, owners of the, uh, the land that Apple sat on, um, recognizing the business potential, actually settled with the original settlers and Apple did not collapse. But by the by time that happened, St. Joseph's establishment had already begun. And the famous uh, rivalry of the 1830s between these two cities had also started. Um, this you would see uh, newspaper articles, uh, major papers in New York and other places in, in the South talking about this rivalry. So it was, it was quite well understood at the time. So St. Joseph, um, the, at the time St. Joseph was established, railroads were an incredibly new technology, right? So it was this, the merchants from Columbus, Georgia, and wealthy cotton, cotton prospectors from Tallahassee, Florida, began to start putting together the St. Joseph Canal Company. Shortly after establishing that, they began to start to kind of invest in this idea of railroads. Um, St. Joseph Railroad was the first steam railroad in Florida, and I've read sources say it's probably the third or fourth steam railroad in the US. So when I say it's a very new technology, it's a very new technology. So the Supreme Court decision had given them the opportunity. Also at this time, uh, let's just say that banking regulation was incredibly lax. Um, you had 
banks being um, organized in small states, printing their own money uh, and having their own internal exchange rate between other banks in the South. And so when you had notes from one bank, you had to go to a bank that would honor those notes. And so it was a very complicated, complex process. But needless to say, wealthy planters that own these banks were also printing their own money. So they were investing. And so this, this heavy cash influx is coming in to, to, to St. Joseph. They also wanted to kind of capture the Apachacola. Pre railroads, rivers were the major highways, steamboats reign supreme. And having access to a nice wide navigable river like the Apachacola, which fed into the Chattahoochee and the Flint River, which basically made it all it could, could be traversed all the way up into um, all the way up north. But they really focused on this area of Columbus, Georgia, and the heart of Georgia cotton industry. And so they had planned, as you can see over here, and I'll show you some slides later, they had planned to use, to scrap the idea of a canal and use this new technology of, um, of railroads to take stuff from ships further up into the Apachacola and began to, to bring traffic up and down this major river system. The town itself was incorporated February 10th, 1836. And their entire goal was to capture international trade. So at the time, the, uh, the empire, uh, the, Brit the Great Britain had its own massive industrial revolution. That industrial revolution brought about a lot of wealth to an emerging middle class. That emerging middle class wanted to buy things. And in this, that emerging middle class created this massive demand for consumerism, uh, which also took place in the United States, but Great Britain was the big market. In particular were, was clothing, cheap cotton to make inexpensive clothing to feed the masses, so to speak, of this new burgeoning middle class. So what their goal at the time was to export cotton from the South to Great Britain, which had not had success trying to replicate cotton growth in their own colonies. They had tried in India and had failed, um, but also to bring goods back from Europe because at the time, the United States really didn't have the kind of, didn't have a, a, the kind of variety of production it later became. became. So a lot of ceramics, goods, plates, a lot of the, the, the dry goods that you, uh, you see in the 19th century, a lot of those were produced in Europe and then shipped over to the United States. So there's this, so you got lots of money, lots of land, lots of demand, and everyone wants, uh, and this huge emerging consumer uh, culture. And they have railroads. So this new technology that had been devised in order for them to move equip, um, supplies from the ships in the harbor to the river and up to these wealthy plantations in Georgia in exchange for cotton to come down. So they initially had done this uh, by creating a railroad from the wharf here at, I don't know if you see my, my mouse here, the wharf here in St. Joseph Bay through a series of railroads over to, into uh, Depot Creek, up Depot Creek into Lake Bumaco, which then fed into the Apalachicola. And at <clears throat> Apalachicola at the time, was not able to sustain deep water ports. So it had to essentially anchor their ships off the coast, take smaller, low, um, smaller draft ships and shuttle supplies from the boats to the shore, put them in a warehouse and then shuttle them to, uh, or load them into steamships to go up and down. This process, they, they had, had predicted that the railroads would be faster than that than that process of unloading the ships because you can unload all the entirety of the shipments into wharfs at the seaport and then have continuous operation of goods to the steamships along Depot Creek and you could bypass the necessity to use these low draft ships. So in 18, October, 1835, 
they began the the Lake Wilmaco to St. Joseph Railroad, which is shown here with the red arrow, arrows on the image, was operational. And it began shuttling things immediately. At about 1839, they had actually built a new railroad rail line uh, that went from for the north of the city from St. Joseph to Iola. They did this because they could avoid a lot of the snags in the lower part of the Apachacola and get supplies to Sacramento faster. Because they had realized that, okay, the railroads were faster, but only a little bit to these the Apachacola. So they weren't quite getting the business they had hoped. They weren't quite attracting the kind of speed that they hoped. So they had begun the process of, of changing the plan. And for all intents and purposes, from what we can tell in the history, it worked. I mean, they, you could get mail delivered to St. Joseph faster than you could get mail delivered to Apalachicola. So why, why did they do this? What's the whole point? So Apalachicola has St. George Island and various other uh, barrier islands, and two, and it comprises a, a really shallow bay. And so these large steamships had to come into the bay, anchor offshore, and use smaller schooners to shuttle their way across uh, to um, wharfs in Apachacola, and then those would to take into steamships and loaded the steamships. And so the proprietors had, had wanted to really um, nail down and kind of uh, utilize uh, really what was uh, a very uh, well-protected and and well-designed deep water port right there in St. Joseph. The only difference problem is that you need to be connected to the river, which they did. So in this image you show, I'm showing uh, in this image in the slide, you can see the Chattahoochee uh, Flint River system to give you an idea of their system going all up to Columbus, Bainbridge, Georgia, Newton, Georgia. These are all heavy, heavy, uh, cotton industry, um, cotton producing uh, industries. And then the, to the left, you have uh, an image of uh, northern uh, Staffordshire, which was a major district for uh, pottery and a lot of uh, very common for plates to be shipped into the United States. So you've got this river system and you've got this demand for goods coming out of the uh, United Kingdom being shuttled and funneled through St. Joseph. And for the most part, they were both somewhat successful. But what really means that really takes this thing to the importance of Florida's beginning is, is kind of how fast they began to establish themselves. So in a matter of months to a few years, they began to really influence themselves politically. Florida held the Constitution Convention in December of 1838. And they chose St. Joseph as that constitutional convention city. And really the only things you, the only thing in St. Joseph, the Port St. Joe today where, where St. Joseph is, is located near that kind of commemorates this town is a woefully outdated museum that I think was built in the late 60s um, with I think the earliest example of animatronics in history um, at the Constitution Museum that's run by the Florida Park Service. But it underscores how quickly this town began, began to rise. Additionally, they began to influence themselves in terms of local government. So state government and local government. They became the, the county seat for Calhoun they had petitioned and were somewhat successful in getting a, um, a tariff uh, a port uh, office located at their port so you could pay tariffs directly from St. Joseph. And they were just humming along. And to say this was a party city, uh, I, mean, I guess I'm looking back at politics today and you, know, you hear about scandals in the news and politicians and how much they're uh, they you know they're, they're you know they're taking these parties and these lavish you know uh, wild events that they have. Well, I got here to tell you that that's been happening forever. Uh, 
St. Joseph was a party city. It had been where a lot of the political elite had moved, had had second homes. In fact, there was a, um, a, a fire and brimstone preacher that was traveling, uh, called Circuit Preacher, was traveling through uh, Mariana, um, St. Joseph, Avicola. And in his journals, uh, when he arrives after about a couple of days, he describes people, you know, having loud parties, getting drunk on the streets, and he called it um, the wickedest city he'd ever seen. And so St. Joseph was, for all intents and purposes, it was humming. It was a fun place. It had massive amounts of political influence. And while it wasn't necessarily accomplishing its initial goal to take all the traffic away from, Saint, uh, from uh, Apostolicola, it had begun to establish itself successfully and economically. And at this time, they'd also begun the process of becoming a vacation spot. Uh, one of Florida's early vacation destinations. They were publishing uh, advertisements in papers in Mobile, Mobile, Alabama, in New Orleans, in Savannah, Georgia. They were trying, they were, right before the collapse of the town, they had, began to establish these, these routes. So you could go onto a small uh, ship that, that would go along the coast and go from Mobile to uh, St. Joseph and have a party, have a good time, spend time on the beach. Um, because St. Joseph was, um, even though Florida is hot in the summer, there's almost always a constant breeze going on uh, uh, off the bay. And if you've ever slept in a house without air conditioning, whether that be a 19th century house or your own house after a hurricane, uh, you, can, uh, you can kind of understand that a breeze means everything to not you know, sweating to death inside your house. And so a lot of these, their, their, their pitch to people was to say, okay, come here. We always have a breeze. And so to come to Florida in the summer and, and stay in a, in a, in a, on, a, on a beach, in a house, in a place that's much cooler. And for all types of purposes, they had all the amenities that you could possibly want. They had hotels. They had schools. They had goods and services that you would find in any major city uh, along the coast. But as the title indicated, Forgotten City, it did not last forever. So to say that St. Joseph was unlucky is kind of an understatement. But it also should be noted that what happened to them also happened to other cities along the Gulf Coast. Yet St. Joseph was the only one to fall. That's primarily one of the things that I'm looking at as interesting in my research is why. I, you, everyone's heard the, uh, the phrase, um, history repeats itself. Well, I prefer the phrase, history tends to rhyme. And so a lot of what we can take from past events can influence how we look at today's events and possibly even influence our decision-making down the road. Uh, we all have gone through... Um, a horrific, uh, we're still going through a horrific pandemic today. You probably have heard uh, references to the Spanish flu, the 1819 Spanish flu. And even some of those lessons from that period have been used and are useful today in public health. People are both predictable and unpredictable at the same time. And so what we can tell from the past and, our, and people's kind of how they develop networks in society, how they, they view the environment, how they deal with um, disaster, tragedy, all these things can kind of look at, you know, the evolution of in human networks. And so that's one of the things I look at is, okay, why do, I, why do we care that St. Joseph fell? Well, we care about it for several reasons. One of those being that it could serve as an analog um, for an ever-increasing uh, well, likely an ever-increasing uh, um, interval of, of natural and public health disasters as a result of today's um, climate change. So St. Joseph in February 21st, 1840, um, had been hit with yellow fever. Now, yellow fever is an absolutely terrible disease that it's spread by mosquitoes 
and it has and can and it had this and it can have and does have a very high mortality rate. Generally speaking, when yellow fever hit, people would just leave. They didn't understand the relationship between mosquitoes and yellow fever. Um, it was also uh, carried by the Aegis aegypti mosquito, which had a very keen ability to survive um, long periods of time without having blood meals and would, could survive a lot on sugary liquids and water. And so they would all, the yellow fever would often travel through the Caribbean onto these uh, Caribbean ships that would bring sugar and, and other kinds of things to, to the United States. And then these ships would then spread this disease to other people who would, you know, other mosquitoes who would then keep the team to spread it and spread it and spread it. And so while yellow fever epidemics were not uncommon along the Gulf Coast, the 1841 epidemic was particularly bad. And if that didn't make it any worse, in the most Florida fashion you can possibly imagine, St. Joseph was also subsequently hit by a hurricane um, on February 28, 1839, and sorry, a tropical storm, a tropical wave, they call it, I think tropical storm, February 28, 1839, and then a full-blown hurricane, September 1841. Um, then they had a fire, which uh, what we don't know a whole lot about, uh, we'll see that some of the archaeological evidence that we've uncovered as part of this project indicates that it's probably might have originated from the industrial district in the center of town, which we'll talk about a little later. And then 1838, 1839 also saw a collapse in banks. Finally, and I think one of the, the, the death blows to the, to the economy was that so Joseph was right, railroads were a really great technology. So great so that by 1841, um, Charleston and Savannah, which were major deep water ports along the East Coast and were preferable for people, ships coming from Europe to the United States in the same way that you know, we had the, the, Su the Suez Canal and the Panama Canal, they could offload their goods and services and not have to go around the peninsula of Florida. By 1841, not only did we have major rail lines from Savannah and Charleston, we also had a number of them under construction, which would connect the center of the cotton, cotton belt with the coastal east, port, east ports, essentially reducing the, uh, the influence of river travel. The town disappeared while many of its starting residents moved back east to the city of Tacola and went west of Texas. Today, it's replaced by modern Port St. Joe. So what, when I undertook my research in 2012 with my master's thesis, one of the first things we wanted to do was kind of get a general understanding of what, where things were. And so we began to really look at and document uh, resources. And what we found, and this is, this is a map that I made in 2012, kind of showing um, St. Joseph, specifically where it roughly lies today uh, on the modern map. And if anyone's been to the coast, uh, this is the best approximation we can have. And this is showing, and really because we have, um, yeah, we have discovered remnants of the railroad track, which allows us to kind of put that in, in perspective. We've also found, we found pilings that relate to the wharf that was built out into the, uh, the bay. So with these two things, we were able to kind of really begin to put the pieces together of kind of how St. Joe looked at. Um, Apachacola, so excuse me, uh, St. Joseph, for St. Joe today, it's kind of encroached, as it, as it has grown, is encroached south into the remnants of the old town. Um, it was Port St. Joe was established north of Old St. Joe, not related to the same kind of commerce, but just because this is Florida and you know Port the the St. Joseph Bay made a good deep water port. And by 1909, 
they have the technology and the ability to create canals to bring goods and services to the interior had advanced. And so Port St. Joe had been established. We also um, have, and this is kind of goes back into the, the debauchery and the, 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 the good times in, in St. Joseph. They had racetracks, they had, they had gambling. Uh, in fact, uh, St. Joseph, along with all these other small uh, towns like Apotecola, Mariana, had developed this really elaborate uh, um, gam racehorse gambling. And I, I think it must have been by the same people, because if you, when you read through the various papers uh, of that time, these races never seem to overlap with each other, and they always seem to be published by the same few people. So we had kind of been able, so with that kind of mapping this out, we could then begin to say, okay, where can we focus in on archeology? span where, where, where should we start looking? Because we can't survey everywhere. Of course, by this time I graduated with my master's degree and went off to work uh, in the public and private sector. So I came out of my PhD, I wanted to really look and kind of come get a more granular sense of, of St. Joseph. And so what you have here is a pamphlet. It's a, it's a circular that was used as kind of a, um, it's kind of a sales tactic. Like you'd go out this map and you show people and you say, hey, look, here's this town we're building. Do you want to invest in this town? Um, kind of the, 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 the uh, so, you know, we don't do, they don't do cold calling, but they'd walk around essentially with these, these representatives and they'd try to, to sell people into, into buying property. And so I'd always wanted to go further and look into the town specifics. And really my primary reason is it's, it's St. Joseph is, is, is a great part of, of, uh, of Florida history, but what I began to realize as I got into it was all I talk about are white men who are politicians. Information about the rest of the population, the non-elite planters, women, enslaved Africans, all these other populations had never really begun, were never really written about, which is not surprising in the South in this period of time. But I had hoped, and I, I continue to hope as part of this project that we can shed more light on these, these different populations because their story deserves to be told too. So one of the first things we began looking at um, is try to map this town out. Because once we can map it out and get some more information, and we can begin to kind of target areas because in, in various journals and various newspaper clippings, they make reference to various areas of the town where certain people may have lived. But without knowing those are, those are at, we really can't begin to reasonably investigate archaeologically. I mean, I don't, I don't have, unless someone in this CGS wants to give me millions of dollars to survey everywhere, uh, we have to kind of uh, pare it down to uh, only a few, uh, uh, a few tests. So we knew going into this project that we had a good understanding of where the wharf was because we had the pilings, we saw artifacts had fallen, we kind of had a good understanding of, okay, the wharf is here, we have a starting point. We know that Commerce Street ran along parallel to the railroad which ran right on to the, the wharf, which could have access to these warehouses where they'd store the material. It was coming out of ships before it was, it was blown on the train and sent to like Wimbico or Iola, depending on when it was, to eventually go up the river to uh, Georgia and Alabama. And we all, all we had at the time were, was this, this kind of map you know, this, this, this proposed plan of, of St. Joseph. Then in the summer of 2019, um, 2018, we ran across this object. This is a copy of it but because the original is so degraded that's hard to photograph. But this had been a letter held in someone's attic for 100 plus years um, of an exchange between uh, Lydia uh, Chelsea 
in New York and a relative that had actually stayed in the St. Joseph area after the hurricane, after all this disaster had happened. They, they tried to maintain and eke out a living in here. Eventually, they ended up moving away, but by 42, 43, even to 44, people probably still lived here. And one of the things that she did was she was describing the town. And as you can see, you probably recognize the, the map that's hand-drawn with the map that you saw as part of the, 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 the flyer or the, 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 the sales pitch uh, map. You see, so we need to know that there was at least some attempt to kind of follow that plan. So we, I was somewhat confident that, okay, we don't know what's built, but we do know that they at least tried to follow the layout of the existing town. And so with that, we kind of had a starting point to begin to look at. Now you see a lot of numbers on here. The original letter <clears throat> was not transcribed over and it's bits and pieces are visible, but it's, it's very difficult to tell what they were saying other than a few pieces that actually identify this as a letter talking about St. Joseph, Florida. One of the things I wish that I still, I see still, still legible are these, these numbers on here they correspond to various areas that she discussed in her letter and only a few of them are, are understood. You see right here, I think uh, Jay Kearney's place, Jay Kenny's place, so you, you know, the courthouse. So you see some that she labeled on here, others that she labeled um, just with numbers, but you see it there at least and she lived in a place that was subdivided. And the reason that you see a lot more detail in the north part of the map is because that's where uh, we believe that she was living at the time she wrote this letter. So uh, she understood a lot about her more general surroundings, but not necessarily about the full layout of the city. So this diagram kind of goes to show that, okay, things here might still exist, which is exciting for me. Then we began doing field work in uh, the summer of 2019, later on in summer of 2019. Um, but we did some preliminary field work in March and we began to kind of look at and really walk around to various people and say, okay, I, we think, I think that this town is here, here's some major areas, let's start knocking on doors and see if we can test people's yards. And, and the residents of Saint, uh, Port St. Joe and were very gracious to allow us to do this. Uh, you can probably tell by the date, this was also after um, Hurricane Michael, I believe Hurricane Michael came and devastated the coast. So a lot of, and even by March 2019, a lot of cleanup is still happening. Um, so we began to kind of focus this northern area here, where it really were kind of first. And we began to kind of really kind of hone in these three areas. And as you can see by the, the red dots, uh, we began finding stuff immediately. So um, that told us that, you know, at least some remnants of St. Joe are still present underneath the ground. We kind of divide this plan to very, we kind of wanted to get various areas uh, on the map kind of spreading it out to see if we could find any evidence to kind of begin to narrow down the, uh, uh, you know, kind of test start my, my theory about whether or not this, how accurate this map is. So a lot of these areas we chose to test because we had access to them. So just that we did one um, location, one with the Chafin site. They found some stuff there. It's located here along the river. I won't talk about this shell test. I mean, they're just images of them. I'm sure you're not that excited about seeing uh, dirt and holes. We began to kind of begin to find stuff. We started to find a lot of stuff. First, a little bit, this area back here um, was... It was very confusing. I think this might have been a, a, a place where they dumped stuff and cleaned up after uh, the hurricane. But we get, really began to find artifacts everywhere. And every time we tested, we found more and more artifacts. Just, it was just showing that. And you can kind of see a lot of the land is cleared and the images around on the top. That's because a lot of these, a lot of places, houses would be around, and then they, but they are all and they're all flattened after Hurricane Michael. So we, this a, a pattern began to emerge, right? And so 
we started to to make in May of 2019 began to move further south. So kind of moving to the other side or right near the center of town. And these are the three areas that we, we investigated in May of 2019. So the first, first, set, first set was just kind of continuing on with, um, with it, which where we'd been before uh, in, in March, we continue to find artifacts. And we just kind of made our way down the beach to, to where we can find stuff. And we really got uh, lucky here. Um, this is property owned by um, Mr. Duran, who owned the local Piggly Wiggly. And he has, he, his family has bought land, it's not, most of it's not developed. And it sits right along the area where we, well, I think the industrial area was. And sure enough, we found artifacts that correlated to industrial artifacts, a lot of melted glass and evidence of fire that we didn't find in other sections of the town, which is kind of why I think the fire may have originated within the center town. And so we began to validate these, these various areas that we had I suspected contained um, the remnants of, of these of the town. Again, we were further south and we came across this particular area. This had been uh, um, right along the beach in the water. And I still don't know much about this uh, because it had been something that locals had been known about for generations. They had kind of gone out there and picked up various plates and artifacts and things like that throughout their lifetime. And I don't know why these artifacts are here. I probably don't, but they were strewn across, you know, uh, a massive area and whole facts. And so we're still trying to figure out and want to get additional testing kind of further to the, the east of that site. But that's kind of, you see May 2019, you know, after which time I, I went into my qualifying exams into the, the, the fall of 2019. And then of course, um, COVID hit and that put a pretty much a stopper on additional stuff. Uh, one of the things they want to go back and do is do just some more testing to validate areas, but also kind of focus in some of these, these spaces here in the center, these liminal spaces that um, might tell us more about working class uh, um, population. Because the planters and the elite people that were getting drunk on the streets of St. Joseph weren't the ones doing the day labor. Also, we want to focus on this, the southern part of the, of the city because in the few accounts we see of enslaved people, we, 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 they are referenced as living in the north part of the city, which is, which is not uncommon for enslaved people to be essentially rented out to locals in the city and living in these communal houses somewhat semi-autonomously um, in a different area. So not necessarily behind a house, but in a kind of a, a segregated section of a city. And one of the goals to continue on is to kind of find that place and really begin to, to understand and tell a story of um, the, what, I, what I believe is a very massive enslaved population that lives there. These are the artifacts that we found along the project. Um, as you can see, um, you see right there in the middle of that wine bottle. Uh, if I never see a wine bottle again in my life, I'll be fine. I'll be content. I literally documented hundreds of these things. So when the when I read the preacher's accounts of drunkenness in the streets and, and debauchery, I can somewhat believe it because you see massive caches of liquor bottles. And I kind of looked at other archaeological sites around the area, other archaeologists. I don't see reference to hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of bottles of, of booze, um, which we see a lot of. But you can see here a lot of the goods. You know, this this plate here to the right um, came as a scene called Canova. It's a standard scene. Uh, this is a lot of very popular, the romantic scenes uh, uh, of Europe, a very popular time. And it's from a place called Stoke upon Trent, which is the Stachy region. So, wine uh, we have we have wine from the Medoc region in France. We have stuff from um, all over Europe uh, because, quite frankly, the goods just we didn't produce that here in the United States until much later on. So we're still dependent this time. We have begun and we're still processing data for a 
the cemetery. St. Joseph had um, yellow fever and they were buried very hastily. And so we began remote sensing the St. Joseph Cemetery, which is um, a fair distance from the town, but in a very high dry area, which is common for cemeteries. We also want to look and see if we can find other cemeteries because we know from accounts that were at least three. Uh, this is only one of them. And it appears based on some of the names we researched, these are probably the uh, more of elite um, class of people. But what's interesting is that we see what we be I believe, and, and I'm still processing data at this point, to be mass graves. So the, the people were dying yellow fever at such a quick rate that they weren't they couldn't keep up with building coffins and they weren't being given um, unique individual grave, uh, uh, unique individual grave sites, which is, was important as part of the 19th century culture. And so to, to have that happen is a pretty drastic uh, difference. And we also don't kind of see this in St. Joseph, uh, in Apochicola or Mariana, some of the other areas. So one of the prevailing theories as to perhaps why St. Saint Joseph didn't exist uh, was maybe got disproportionately affected by uh, the pandemic, their, their epidemic. Um, there's other reasons too, uh, they were also very new. And I think a lot of the individuals that, we can kind of tell a lot of the individuals that were the pillars of these communities that had a lot of the, the political, social and monetary connections um, were victims uh, in this epidemic. So these severing of connections and social ties um, kind of probably contributed to the demise of this town, which is interesting if you take that and you look at resiliency, the lack of resiliency in St. Joseph and apply that to like today, like, okay, what if, you know, hurricane wipes through a, a, a town? What are some of the contribution factors that would both help or hinder its ability to bounce back? And so understanding these kind of social connections are, are important, um, both then and today. And that's just part of one of the reasons of the project as well. One of the exciting founds, one of the exciting finds uh, that we did in the summer um, really has, uh, it's kind of a, a, it's fitting that this would be one of the things we find in a town like St. Joseph. So we, it says possible lighter image, the old St. Joe track, this is a, a while back, but um, we pretty much confirmed it as such. You can somewhat see it blown up there, but, uh, we were able to find the horse track, horse race track. And as far as I know, it's the only race track that's been archeologically documented. Um, there are others, uh, I, if you know one, please send me a reference to it. But um, I, I don't know of any other example of that. But the, and this also is important too, because a lot of references in terms of objects, places, and things that we see written in these accounts are reference in relation to other objects and places. And the racetrack is one of those places, especially in the late, later stages of St. Joseph's construction. A lot of references for X distance from the racetrack or X in the racetrack. So having the racetrack found before COVID hit was a pretty important thing because now as we go through and, and try to identify other areas to investigate, um, we can kind of have a better rough understanding of where they were, they were at. Um, as part of a future project, the, the project uh, right now, it's it's trying to get permission to go back and really begin to kind of uh, investigate that southern half. And really, I want to try to find um, more evidence of other social classes. Um, but what we have accomplished, my my goal, my, my, one of my goals of this project was to kind of begin the process of revamping down to the street level, uh, St. Joseph and its environs. Any questions? Thanks, Chris. That was awesome. Uh, we did have some questions in the chat. Um, if anyone has a question, just go ahead and type it away. Uh, Sonny Kier Jensen asked, did they have sleeping porches to take advantage of the breeze? Yeah, yeah. So construction of the houses, and actually, there's a few houses that were moved over to um, Apachacola, and we know that because there's evidence of that. And uh, uh, I was planning on going back to take pictures uh, in the beginning of 2020, 
but that didn't happen. So <laughs> get images. But yes, they would have had. I mean, you can, if you want a good example of kind of how layouts occur, there's, if you want to go to Ferndia Beach to Fort Clinch, they've got living quarters. And it's very similar to how they would have had sleeping porches. They also would have had lots and lots of windows and they would have built it kind of in a way to kind of uh, um, take advantage of of the the breeze that came uh, the pattern of breeze that came along so the sleeping porches were very common um they had uh, uh lots and lots of windows and lots of cross breezes so that's one thing you'll see in these houses is you know you have a, a corresponding window to every other window so you always have the ability to open and windows in different configurations to to give you maximum breeze and makes a huge difference at night. I, I, I've slept without, um, I slept in some of these 19th century houses without power. And it's, it's amazing in May in Florida, how cool it can get it, if you just have the windows in the right place open. Um, also, being elevated too, that breeze does, does tend to blow a little, little, uh, little stronger at the top. Um, so a lot of the second floors, uh, usually uh, were best utilized for that type of uh, breeze. Awesome. Alan Bailey asked, did the railroad track headed northeast go to Wewahichka? Yes, so uh, you, good, good on you. Uh, modern Wewahichka is very close to where Iola was. Um, Iola, um, You'll, if you go to Wewa, you will see next to the, the main high school, I think it's Wewa Hitchcock High School, there's a little marker and it shows, um, you know, the, it says the railroad went through here at Iola. If you go to um, the Dead Lakes where they do a lot of the bass fishing, you'll see just off the bridge, a, I, I documented this as well as a, um, a piece of what I believe is the trussle for the Isola Railroad. So there are still rivets in there, and there's still more to find uh, a lot in Wabi Hitchka. It's just uh, a matter of time. But yeah, now Wewa is 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 roughly um, where Iola was, and or where I should say 19th century Iola was, and the railroad did definitely run through Wewa Hitchka. Uh, awesome. And then Elizabeth Dunham asked, "Do you know of any connection between St. Joseph and the St. Joseph?" Uh, now Sanford. I don't know any connection between St. Louis and Sanford. Um, that's interesting. It's, you know, we, it's been really, one of the things that we've kind of started and we did with Iola, what we kind of want to do is hopefully the next person takes up this project or maybe later on is begin to take these individual connections and kind of see where people moved and, and you know, look at the, the wider network. But no, no I don't, I'm not aware of any connection with, uh, with Sanford, Florida and St. Joseph. But that doesn't mean there wasn't one. Okay, thanks. Uh, that looks like all the questions. Um, there, there are a few comments if you want to read those, Chris. But uh, oh, one just popped up from uh, Lisa Peniera. While doing surveys, did you find indigenous artifacts? Yes, one indigenous artifact, uh, possible a ceramic. Um, and we do know that when I did the research in 2012 at the depot, we did recover a few indigenous artifacts. And they actually, are, if, in my thesis, they are mentioned in my master's thesis uh, about them. Um, there are other, some other students that are working on the indigenous areas around there, but no, the, the, the area of St. Joseph do, did have a very um, robust indigenous population prior to settlement. So uh, we do, I haven't found a whole lot in the, in the city proper, but. When I did it when we worked at the depot in 2012, we did find, I did find um, indigenous artifacts. And it's also, the, the depot is also very close to a known, um, a known uh, uh, Native American mount. Okay, that looks like all of the questions. Thanks again so much, Chris, and uh, thanks everyone for attending. We will be back in uh, September, but try to come to the picnic in June if you can. Thanks, everyone.